be many opportunities to serve. Are you interested in serving? Please come by the Welcome Center to sign up. If you should have any questions, please see Ray Perfarzik or call him at 678-362-6247. We have a new opportunity to serve. We are starting a special needs ministry. This ministry will serve individuals from birth to adult. Please see Angela Cook for additional information. A Deacon Family Fellowship is planned for family names beginning with C, I, P, and Y on April 14th following the morning service. Please sign up at the Welcome Desk or RSVP your Deacon. If you should have any questions, please see Mike Pullen, John Hawkin, or Herman Fox. Our next men's prayer breakfast will be Saturday, April 20th at 8 a.m. Please come and join us for a hearty breakfast and wonderful fellowship. I want to welcome each one of you to Recobeth Baptist Church. We are truly glad you were with us today. Welcome to Drawing from the Well, the preaching ministry of Recovered Baptist Church with Senior Pastor Alan Stewart. We trust you'll be blessed and find faith, hope, and comfort as we draw from the principles and promises of the Word of God together. Well, God bless you. We welcome you to our Wednesday night service, and I hope you're having a good week, and I pray that God's doing great things and abundantly blessing you. As we hit the midpoint of this week, and sometimes by this time of the week, you just need your gas tank filled up again to get you back in here on Sunday. And I hope and pray God will do that out of this service tonight. You know we open our Wednesday night services in a time and season of prayer. Ten items, one minute apiece that we'll spend in prayer. And so would you join me as we begin this service in prayer, praying for the needs and burdens of a lot of folks in our church family that need us to come alongside them tonight. So let's open in a time of prayer.
Good evening. Let's stand together as we sing, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious people said. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. As you're being seated, I want to welcome you again to our service tonight. And uh, again, I hope you're having a good week. May God do something out of the message tonight that'll be exactly what you need. And I pray that he'll feed your soul in some way out of his word tonight. A couple of announcements real quick. Those of you who are uh, underneath the deacons of Mike Pullen, John Hawkins, and Herman Fox this coming Sunday. There's going to be a deacon family luncheon immediately following the service. If you have not signed up, do that at the welcome desk so that they can have an idea of how many to prepare for. And then next week, those who are with... Um, Daryl Burchard and Dennis Rapson. I'm doing this off of memory right here, so I hope I got it right. They, their families will be next Sunday. We're trying to do at least one a month, and uh, the first one got bumped from March into April, and so we've got two back-to-back. And if you would, again, sign up for that one if you're one of their families for next week's luncheon. And then there'll be another one, Tom O'Keefe and Ray Perfarzib. Their families are going to be on May the 5th, and there will be a sign-up sheet out there at the Welcome Center as well. So please sign up if you want to be a part of that and come. It's just a good time of fellowship, getting to know your deacons, your deacon getting an opportunity to know you, and just spend some personal time with you for just a few moments on a Sunday afternoon. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the goodness of your heart, the grace and mercy that you extend to us every single day. Father, we'll probably live our life to the fullest here and never, ever grasp just how much you really have loved us. The favor that you extend to us, the affection that you give, it's overwhelming when we can sit down and ponder it and look back over our life and see all the things that you have just put in place for us. May tonight, Lord, you just take a very simple message, apply it to where people are. May there be something out of it that will feed their soul tonight. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand once more. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Let's sing it together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. 
Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. All right, if you've got your Bibles, would you take them and find the book of John, John chapter 6 tonight. And I want to continue a series, a study that I began last week, I Am, on the I Am statements of the Lord Jesus, some very powerful things that He said. Warren Wiersbe has wrote a book on the seven sayings here of the I Am's of Jesus, and he's titled it, Jesus in the Present Tense. And I love that title because Jesus is not I was. He is not I will be. He is I am. And so I hope and pray somehow, some way to make it relevant 
to where you and I are today to understand the importance of why Jesus told us on seven occasions, I am. Here in John 6, let's begin reading in verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set His seal on Him. Then they said to Him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. Now you believe in Him whom He sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to Him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to Me shall never hunger, and he who believes in Me shall never thirst." I would guess tonight it's not a surprising fact to you to know that Americans love to eat. Nor would it be surprising to you to know that Thanksgiving is the biggest day of eating throughout the whole year. However, it may surprise you to learn that the second biggest day of eating in America is Super Bowl Sunday. On that day alone, Americans will consume 1.2 billion chicken wings. That's enough for every American to have three on Super Bowl Sunday. 12.9 million pounds of bacon and 11.2 million pounds of potato chips. According to a study of Cornell University, the average American will eat more than 6,000 calories on Super Bowl Sunday. It may also surprise you to learn that Americans are near the bottom of the list throughout all the world when it comes to eating bread. In our culture of diets and all of these fads in our country today, bread and carbs have sort of fallen out of favor. We're told the average American will eat 53 pounds of bread annually compared to 440 pounds per person in Turkey. In other parts of the world, there are people who will rise up as early as 5 a.m. in the morning to get their hands on some fresh bread in the morning. In fact, you travel to most any country and sit in any restaurant, and you know what's going to happen? They're going to serve you bread. It may be in the form of a tortilla in Mexico, a bagel in New York, pumpernickel in Germany, sourdough in France, or maybe rye in Holland and Hungary. Bread has become a staple in many cultures throughout the history of our world, and that's one of the reasons why you'll see the word bread from Genesis to Revelation over 500 times. But listen, bread is available everywhere in the world, And here tonight, we're reminded in this passage of Scripture, so is Jesus Christ. In fact, Max Licato helps us with that when he writes, What bread is for hunger, Jesus claims to be for the soul. Jesus gave us a confirmation of that statement in Matthew 4 and verse 4 when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. With that thought in your mind, and I don't want to speak to you on a very simple subject, heaven's bread. In this passage of Scripture, we find one of only two of our Lord's miracles that were recorded in all four of the Gospels. One was the resurrection, of course, and now this one, the miracle of turning a little boy's lunch into a feast for thousands of people. But now with their stomachs full, their needs have been met, the people sort of relish the idea of keeping Jesus around. 
In fact, they want to take him and make him their king. They found somebody that's going to provide for them. Maybe in their day they didn't call them socialists, but they were socialists on this day. They wanted somebody that was going to give them something free, and Jesus was going to be that person. They believed that he was the prophet that was predicted by Moses. And Moses fed the multitudes in the wilderness with manna. But now they're seeing Jesus had done the same thing in Galilee with bread and with fish. But it wasn't Moses who gave them the manna. Jesus points out to them, it was God who did that. And that manna did not last very long. But Jesus is offering something that's going to last throughout all of eternity. He's pointing out that He has come to fill every spiritual void and the emptiness of our lives with the eternal bread of God. Now, you think about this. In some way, some form, bread is eaten daily. But then there are some fruits and vegetables that are only available in season. For example, I love Macintosh apples. I love the whang of a Macintosh apple. But they're only available for a certain season throughout the year. Not so with bread and not so with Jesus. Jesus should be brought to our table every single day. We are to let Him nourish our hearts, and in just a certain months or occasions of the year, that's not for Jesus. Jesus is for every day of our life. And that's why He taught us to pray in the model prayer, Matthew 6 and verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. You see, Jesus is daily to us. But then you think about this, bread is served in many forms. It is toasted, it is jellied, it is buttered, it is flattened, it is grilled. It can be a sandwich, a sweet roll, a hot dog bun, a croissant, or a dinner roll. Bread can meet many needs, and here's the point I want you to see, so can Jesus. The psalmist said this in Psalm 37 and verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. So I hope you're beginning to see why Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. He is the very core of sustenance for our spiritual being. But here's the main point. Jesus did not come into the world mainly to give bread. He came into the world to be bread. Jesus is your bread that can meet every single need of your life. Four very simple things I want you to see tonight. First of all, I want you to notice the symbolism of bread. Notice again in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, the pronoun I here means that it comes from within, and this statement is something that is very personal. But the word am is in the present tense. Again, it's not I was in the past, or it's not I will be in the future. But I am right here, right now. But as Jesus says these words, I am, he does something extraordinary in the Greek language. He takes two verbs and he puts them together. And it may sound a little redundant to you, but Jesus is getting something very powerful across to us. Here's the little rendering of it. I am, I am, or I, even I am. Now, that may sound reasonably familiar to you. You may remember Moses comes to God and he says, Now, before I go to Pharaoh, God, I'm going to have to tell him who it is that's sending me and saying, Let God's people go. What am I supposed to say? Do you remember God's answer in Exodus 3 and verse 14? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So every time Jesus uses one of these I am metaphors, he is emphatically stating that he is Yahweh. He is the great I am of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. 
This then sets off a conversation about Moses and the manna that was provided to them in the wilderness. You'll notice in verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so now what Jesus begins doing, he starts to symbolize himself with that manna that was given in the wilderness. And I want you to think through the Scripture with me, the various ways that we're told about this manna and how Jesus symbolizes that manna. In the Bible, we're told that the manna came down from heaven every day. And here, Jesus came down from heaven. The Bible tells us that the manna lay on the ground. It is a picture of Jesus, the meek and the lowly. If you'll recall, Jesus was not born in a king's palace, but in a manger. He never used the riches that were at his disposal, but he lived a poor life the whole time he was in this world. In fact, most everything Jesus ever had was borrowed. He borrowed a boat, he borrowed a colt, and he borrowed a tomb. The manna, we're told, was round. That speaks of the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you know this tonight, but Jesus did not have his beginning in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us in John 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible tells us the manna was white, which speaks of the pure, sinless, holy nature of Jesus Christ. Paul confirmed it in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He was born without sin, he lived without sin, and he died without sin. He was impeccable in his life, in his character, and in his integrity. The Bible told us that the manna had the taste of honey. That reminds us of the sweetness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the same token, all those who received Jesus as Lord and Savior Have you not found him to be sweet to your soul? That's why David encouraged us in Psalm 34 and verse 8 to taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible tells us that the manna had a taste of oil, which speaks of that anointing that was on Jesus Christ. He was anointed to come and set the captives free and to break all the chains of bondage in our life. Jesus was the one who was anointed. The Bible tells us the manna had to be picked up. That is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible then tells us the manna had to be ingested, which speaks of you and I partaking of Jesus Christ. Here in this same chapter in John 6, verse 53, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Then the Bible tells us the manna sustained physical life, which speaks of Jesus who gives us eternal life. All of that and more is a picture of Jesus Christ. Here's what it's a reminder to us all tonight. Jesus is all you need. If you've got a hunger in your heart, and I want you to know Jesus is heaven's bread that will satisfy every single need of your life. The second thing I want you to see tonight, and that is the satisfaction of bread. Again, here in verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, now listen to this, shall never hunger. Now, you all know this, that we live in a world of people who will do anything under the sun in order to be satisfied in life. In fact, every person that's on planet Earth today, they are searching for life, and they're searching for meaning in life. Whether it's the drunkard, the drug addict, the prostitute, the corporate climber, the country hillbilly redneck, and even many people who are sitting in a church building. Every single person is looking for meaning in life. And even though all persons are looking for life, many people are just simply searching in all the wrong places. 
You remember Jesus' words on this in Matthew 6 and verse 25, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so now Jesus begins to talk to them about spiritual bread and about feeding on Him for their spiritual hunger. You see, our spirit also has spiritual hunger. And so what Jesus is saying in essence here is, I am to your spirit what bread is to your body. Now keep in mind, anytime you find bread in Scripture, it is more than just literal bread, but it is a symbol of the material needs of life. So when Jesus here is telling His followers He is the bread of life, He's giving them a solution, not just for their physical hunger, but also for their emotional, their mental, and especially their spiritual hunger of life. Now, it may be very true in some moments of our life that we just simply need a real loaf of bread. I mean, you may find yourself in a time of life where you've been laid off in some corporate cutbacks. Listen, Jesus is the bread of life. And so when you declare your need of Him and you turn to Him as your Savior, He will not only satisfy your spiritual needs, but He will take care of every single need every day of your life. That's the promise we got in Philippians 4 and verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I want you to think with me why this symbolism of bread is so important in our satisfaction. First of all, bread was the most important part of the meal. When you and I generally go to a restaurant, let's all be honest, our focus is on the entree that we're there to order. That basket of bread they set on the table is usually secondary to you. Unless you're at Red Lobster, maybe Logan's, maybe Longhorn's. In Jesus' day, get this though, meat was simply a side rare dish. And the bread represented the major part of the meal. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, here's what he's saying to us. I am the most important piece of your life. Secondly, everyone had access to bread. Poor people used barley to make bread, while the wealthier people, they used wheat. But most everyone had the means to make or to buy bread. By using this metaphor, Jesus is saying this, He is available to everyone. The rich, the poor, the black, the white, it doesn't matter their country, their culture. Jesus is bread for everyone in the world. Thirdly, bread was the means of fellowship. Do you remember what was said of the early church in Acts 2 and verse 42? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and listen to this, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. In that culture, when you broke bread with someone, you were friends with them for life. As an interesting side note, do you recall when Jesus resurrected from the dead and He met those disciples on the road to Emmaus? They did not recognize Him until He did a certain thing. Listen to it in Luke 24 and verse 35. He was known to them in the breaking of bread. It was a reminder to them that Jesus offers us a friendship that will never, ever end. Fourthly, bread symbolizes God's presence. It's interesting to me that the very word Bethlehem in the Old Testament Hebrew simply means house of bread. And then you'll find in the Old Testament in Numbers 4 and verse 7 that in the temple the showbread was to continually be there to remain on the table. That word showbread can literally be interpreted show up bread or in Hebrew terms face bread. This bread was a heavenly symbol of God Himself. 
and a reminder to his people that every time they ate bread, they should think of him. Can we be honest here tonight? Anybody ever think of God when you eat bread? Most of us don't. And interestingly, if a person there during that time would see a scrap of bread on the road, they would pick it up and put it on a tree branch for the birds to eat. Why? Because it was to never be trampled underfoot. Because it carried with it this element of mystery and sacredness. To them, it was a symbol of God's presence. So now you've got a better understanding of what Jesus is saying here in this passage. Again, I am to your spirit what bread is to your body. Friends, listen, the greatest need of your heart is the greatest concern to God. He came to earth to demonstrate God's personal care for you and for me. And Peter says this in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You see, what our world needs more than anything is just simply Jesus. Because He alone is the bread of life who satisfies our every need. Have you taken the time today to just simply come to Him and tell Him what your biggest need and burden is? Third thing I want you to see, and that is the sustainment of bread. Look then over at verse 51 in the chapter. As this dialogue continues, He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I want you to catch something in this narrative. Again, this happens in this story here. Jesus has just miraculously fed, the Bible tells us, 5,000 men. There could have been as many as fifteen to 20,000 people if you counted the women and children that were there on this day. Here's what we're told about that miracle in John 6 and verse 11, that they ate as much as they wanted. And it's just like Jesus to supply for us in this way. Verse 12, then, we're told that they had so much that there was leftovers. Let me make that relevant for today. I'm going to guess that most of you on Thanksgiving, you sit down with your family, you eat a Thanksgiving meal, and you wonder who was stuffed more, the turkey or you. And so after you've eaten, I mean, you are completely satisfied and stuffed. That's about 1.30. And then what happens? Around 7 o'clock that night, you're back in the kitchen poking around in the refrigerator, looking at all the stuff that's there, trying to find something else to eat. Isn't it amazing? You see, listen, God allows us in the physical realm to have a continuing appetite that we might experience a continual satisfaction. When you feed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't eat just one meal and you never eat again. You may say, Pastor, listen, if you're satisfied, why would you want more? God made us to both be satisfied and hungry that we might be satisfied again. Let me give you a couple of verses. Matthew 5 and verse 6, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. I want you to listen to the tone of this in the Greek. Those who keep on hungering and keep on thirsting, are going to keep on being satisfied. Psalm 107 and verse 9, He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, that is God's guarantee. If you will dare to hunger, God will dare to fill you and to satisfy you. How many of you have already learned in your walk with God, He is not stingy with His grace? God gives to us every day. Our cups will overflow with blessings if we would just simply learn to receive them. Now, you think about this. If a man doesn't have an appetite, one of two things is wrong in him. Number one, he could be sick. But number two, it could be that he's already stuffed full of something else. 
If tonight you have got a hunger for the things of God, you need to thank God for this appetite because, listen, it is a sign of you being spiritually healthy. I don't know how much of God that you've got in your life tonight, but I'll tell you this much, you have all that you want. If you don't have any more, it's because you don't want any more of God in your life. I want you to listen to Solomon's wisdom on this in Proverbs 27 and verse 7. A satisfied person despises honey. That is, if you're full, even honey doesn't look or sound good to you. He continues, but to a hungry person, any bitter thing is sweet. Last thing I want you to see tonight, and that is the simplicity of bread, beginning in verse 47 of the text. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Now listen to this. The Greek word for bread, as it is used throughout this entire dialogue, refers to common, ordinary bread. He's not talking about something fancy, just normal, everyday bread. How many of you know that bread is really such a simple thing of life? In fact, there are over a hundred different kinds of of bread. And that's why in the Scripture, bread becomes a symbol for all the material things of life. I remind you again, Jesus taught us to pray, Matthew 6 and verse 11, give us this day our daily, normal, ordinary bread. Martin Luther gave us a description of the meaning of this verse when he said, what does daily bread mean? Everything that nourishes our body and meets our needs, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, yards, fields, cattle, money, possessions, a devout spouse, devout children, devout employees, devout and faithful rulers, good government, peace, health, discipline, honor, good friends, faithful neighbors, and other things like these. As you and I learn in our life to pray for ordinary, normal, everyday bread. We are reminded that God not only takes care of the big things of our life, but God takes care of the small and simple details of life. God is concerned about every area of your life. And so if we are living in daily bread, it ought to change some things about us. Let me tell you some things that it ought to cause in us as I close tonight. Number one, if we're living in daily bread attitude, we ought to have a gratitude for God for all His blessings. The chief principle of the Christian life is gratitude for God to God for every single blessing that He gives. Everything of value that you and I possess in one way or another, it all comes from the hand of God. James writes in James 1 and verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. Every single thing that you have right now, the clothes, the food, the friendships, the education, the mind that you use, even the very breath that you are breathing, it is a gift from God every single day. Consider the words that Moses said to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 10, When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which He has given you. David said in Psalm 145 and verse 16, You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Are you grateful for the daily bread that Jesus has given to you? Secondly, it ought to bring a contentment with God for what He has already given. We are invited in that passage to ask for bread, not cake. We're to pray, give us our daily bread, not our daily desserts. 
Again, you're told it's bread, not chocolate eclair that we're to be asking for. We are to trust God for the daily things we really need. Now, it's true tonight that a pauper is going to pray this prayer very differently than the way a prince will pray this prayer. But the principle is the same. Pray and ask God for the things that you really need, but then do as the writer said in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, be content with such things as you have. It would do us well to often pause and ponder the words of Solomon, Proverbs 30, beginning in verse 8, Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and to say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. We're to have gratitude. We're just to be contentment in our heart. But thirdly, there ought to be confidence that God will meet all your needs. Do you believe tonight that God can meet every need every single day? Now, here's the truth. We really don't like to live like that because most of us have refrigerators and freezers at home that are filled with food. I mean, we've got plenty of food. And there's nothing wrong with that, but a freezer filled with food makes it more challenging to pray for daily bread with sincerity in your heart. If we had been the ones who were giving this model prayer, we would have probably written it to say something like this, give us this week our weekly bread. Or God, give us this month our monthly bread. Some of us would go so far to say, God, give us this year our yearly bread. God, just give it all to us at once and we'll be fine and we can trust you better. But how many of you know God doesn't work that way? He works by teaching His people moment by moment dependence upon Him. As Matthew Henry says, this really means that the followers of Jesus Christ are to have a hand-to-mouth existence. Again, we don't like to live this way. The psalmist said in Psalm 84 and verse 11, The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. A last principle. Genero we'll have generosity toward those less fortunate. Now, here's what our modern world says to us. Look out for old number one. Make sure that no one is gaining on you or ahead of you. It is a tough dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, so get on top any way that you can. How different that is from the words of Jesus in Luke 6 and verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Friends, this is what the Christian life is all about. And to live like this, it opens up a whole new way of looking at life and this world. I'm sure you know this. Our world is filled with starving people. Now, there are some who are physically starving in other parts of the world. But right here in our own land, there are people who are starving to death spiritually. And we are to give and to pray, thinking about those around us who have no bread. I've heard it said that evangelism is just simply this, one beggar telling another beggar where to go find the bread. Ladies and gentlemen, we found the bread. And it's in Jesus. You remember what Jesus said to us as he gave us this example? Luke 22 and verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and then gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Listen, not only does every time that we come around the communion table, we're reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus, but ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Every time that you give a piece of bread to someone in this world, you're reminding them of what Jesus has done. Last thing I want to close here tonight with. In his book, A Gentle Thunder, Max Licato tells the story of a beggar who came and sat before a baker, and he said to him, I want bread. And so the baker pulled out his cookbook and began to tell him about all the recipes that he had about bread. After about a 40-minute discourse, the beggar said, I just want bread. The baker applauded his choice and took him down to the bakery. He guided him through the hallowed halls and pointed out the rooms where the dough was prepared. The ovens were heated to bake the bread. And yet the beggar still insisted, I just want some bread. The baker then took the beggar to the room of inspiration. It was full of stained glass windows. Every week, hundreds of people came from miles around to hear the baker stand up and read a recipe from the cookbook of life. He looked at the beggar and said, would you like to hear me? The beggar said, no, but I would like some bread. The baker then escorted him to the door, and he said, I want you to look. Up and down this street, you'll find many bakeries, but they're not serving the true bread like I serve it. One adds two spoons of salt instead of one. Another's oven is heated three degrees too hot. The beggar turned and began to walk away. And the baker asked, don't you want bread? The beggar stopped, looked back, shrugged his shoulders. And he said, I guess I finally just lost my appetite. The baker then shook his head and said, what a shame that the world is not hungry for bread anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the fresh bread. We have the true bread. And every day we have the opportunity to feed off of Jesus. He meets every single one of our needs. I'll be honest with you as I close tonight. I sat down today and just began looking back and reflecting over my life at different stages and phases from being in school, being in college, working a secular job, just everything of how God has worked and how God sustained me with bread along the journey. And I guarantee you, sitting here in this place tonight, I'm not alone. There are those of you that you can look back and there was just enough bread. You know, it's funny. Elijah was sustained when old birds would just simply come and give him a few crumbs a day in a time when there was famine. And do you know that God does the same thing in our life? I don't know about you, but there's been some times and seasons in my life spiritually where I found myself in a spiritual famine. I was dry. You know what God did just a little pinch at a time? He might send some old crow <laughs> just to give me a little bite of bread that got me to the next day. And friends, I'm here to tell you tonight, God will do that for you. I don't know what your needs are. I don't know what your burdens are. But I know this, Jesus is daily. Just like bread, He is daily. And He wants to meet your every need tonight. Heads bowed and eyes closed. They come with a song of invitation. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and our altar's going to be open. And maybe tonight, wherever you are in your life's journey, I'm going to believe that this altar tonight is going to be filled with little pieces of bread. For someone who needs it to get through this night. I want you to come to Him. And I want you to receive from Him. He is the bread of life. Heaven's bread that was sent down to us. Would you take it tonight? Holy Spirit of God, it's my prayer that you would meet us where we are. You know our burdens. You know our needs. 
would you give us a taste of heaven's bread tonight that will minister, satisfy, totally fulfill. We look to heaven tonight. Would you feed us, Father? And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, our altars are open. Would you come? All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me fill thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I pray that there was just something in this message, even if it was just a crumb, that fed your soul, met a need in your life, and God will use it. Get you back into this place Sunday and see what he's going to do in this place. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Patrick, I'll let you close this out, brother. And there is victory in Jesus. Let's sing it together. Oh, victory. Jesus, my Savior forever, He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Have a great evening. We'll see you back Sunday morning.